when we're waiting on people to start um, sending in their questions and answers. I have a couple of wee questions. Um, that somebody asked me earlier today, can you eat nettles? Um, and what could you make with nettles? You want to go, Claire? Yeah, I was going to say, I just wait for you there. Um, so yeah, so absolutely. So the recipe that Erin just did actually is perfect for using nettles. Um, uh, nettles are a lovely kind of very neutrally flavored green um, that have a really long season. So you can pick them, you can pick them really from the start of spring as soon as they come up and you can pick them now. But there's a few provisos about picking them um, at this point in the year. So you want to pick nettles that are not in um, seed and not in flower. And the reason for that is that there is um, a little kind of crystal buildup that will um, develop in nettles once they get mature. Um, it's not so good for your kidneys, it might give you kidney stones. Um, so avoid the nettles that have the seeds and the flowers on them if you want to use the leaves. Um, but the good thing about nettles is that they have um, new growth throughout the year. So even until now, and even until October, or even November time, you can still find um, nettles with without those um, without those on them. So you can kind of pick the new growth still. Um, so yeah, so uh, nettles are incredibly versatile. Um, uh, kind of like say like a neutral green. So they have um, lots and lots of versatility. Use them anyway. I always suggest that you use them anyway. You would use like spinach. Um, so you can pop them into a curry or put them into nettle soup. Is quite a classic. But anyway, you would use like, you know, fresh grains. You can use nettles in the same way. Um, a nice thing I like to make with them is actually pesto. So um, gather your nettles. Um, so obviously nettles have a sting. So it's it's very advisable to wear gloves. Um, and uh, it's also advisable to give them a wee blanch before you use them as well, if you want to use them like a herb. So give them a blanch, um, blend them up like you would um, uh, basil or any other herb you would use for a, a pesto and then mix in your parmesan and your olive oil and uh, pine nuts or hazelnuts are quite nice to use for pesto too and um, that's like a really lovely simple recipe and they have um, they actually have really really beautiful flavor like surprisingly good flavor for that kind of recipe and I was going to say there's quite a lot of like sort of anecdotal or maybe not anecdotal evidence that Colcannon, which is obviously a traditional dish here, was originally made with nettles rather than with the cabbage. So um, uh, I guess nettles are kind of plentiful and delicious, but also maybe in times of, um, you know, crop harvest failures and things like that, they would have been probably used to kind of bulk out meals as well. So yeah, so, um, similar to, to what Claire was saying, obviously once you've harvested them, then you could cook them down, blanch them, um, and then, you know, chop them up finely and mix them through your mashed potato with milk and scallions and that is delicious so mm. that, that's great thank you and by just in case anybody doesn't know or you know whether they're, they're not that familiar with with cooking blanching just means um putting them into boiling water for a very short space of time and then into into cold water to you know to cool them down and keep the keep the color mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah great okay um Okay, another question. Um, talking about grains, which tree leaves can you eat? So that's leaves from trees. That's a really good question. I'm glad, I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad somebody asked, actually, because it's one thing when I was thinking about this webinar this evening, I was like, oh, tree leaves, because tree leaves are, um, I, think, I think personally are really um, underrated, undervalued food source that not a lot of people realize that there's lots of tree leaves that we can eat. Um, so you wanna pick them at the right time of year. So unfortunately at this time of year, um, tree leaves are not so good for consuming as they are, but you could use them for tea. So at this time of year, leaves that are good for tea are hawthorn and beech and even oak. So oak has quite a strong tannic flavor in its leaves, um, but they are usable for tea. Um, but in the springtime, you get loads of different um, trees that are suitable for um, uh, eating um, just as they are, just as even a, a kind of salad green. So um, beech are wonderful in the springtime. There's a very small window to eat those kind of early spring um, when they're still beautiful and pale green and translucent. And they have amazing flavor, very surprising flavor, like slightly 
uh, citric, uh, like acidic flavor in them, lovely and fresh. Um, and I would eat them just as they are. I would eat them completely raw. I wouldn't even use them for anything. They're kind of like a, they're kind of like a trail snack, um, beech leaves at that time of the year. Um, hawthorn as well, the same. So um, the hawthorn are wonderful first leaves of the season, usually uh, to come out kind of just as, just as winter is ending, we'll see hawthorn leaves appearing on the on the um, trees. And those are delicious, again, as a salad grain um, as they are, or put them into things, just as we were talking about um, nettles, or even into the Spanakopita recipe um, that Erin was using, um, like really lovely inclusion and very, very bountiful as well um, in this part of the world. Um, what else is good? Lime leaves as well, one of my favorites. So they're kind of a later spring um, leaf. So you're talking kind of end of April time when they start to appear. Um, lime leaves, if you don't know what lime tree, um, I, I always um, use the example of the trees that's dormant. So those big, that big um, avenue of trees that runs run up to, to storm alongside Stormont Estate. Those are all lime tree leaves. So lime or tilia is the scientific name. Um, they are not lime as in citrus lime. They are just, uh, it's just kind of a nickname that they've, they've they've got over the years but yes so those um tree leaves are one of my favorites and I get quite excited when they start to appear because they're incredibly versatile um quite delicious slightly sweet um leaf that have loads of applications so again as a salad grain as a base for a soup or in a spanakopita um but also they get quite big so I've used them as fine leaves for wrapping up little rice dishes or I'll use them as a base for like steaming dumplings or um, or wrapping things around to kind of protect them. So like a piece of fish or something like that. So like really, really versatile and really, really tasty, good, kind of slightly sweet, neutral flavor, kind of like a useful, a useful plant to know. Wow, there's so, so much you'd need to be taking notes, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Erin? What Have you got a favorite leaf that you would use? Uh, oh, I, I actually must admit that I don't use loads of leaves, but one thing that we do use quite a lot are pine needles. So um, pine has a is amazingly pine pines are edible. Now not all conifers are edible, so you need to make sure that you're um, you're using a true pine. Um, but the the both the needles and actually the the little young green cones. Um, are edible as well um, and uh, actually I missed the window this year we have a pine tree here and we had actually meant to do it but we did miss it but when I was in Ukraine a few years ago um, they make an amazing kind of pine they take the cones and kind of um, cook them down in syrup and they almost become like little kind of jellied sweets and they call it pine needle honey or a pine cone honey um, and it's amazing like they would then spread it on their toast or something like that in the morning or serve it kind of over dessert um, but pine needles uh, can be, you know, uh, boiled up um, and, you know, infused into kind of a sugar syrup as well. Um, and that makes a really interesting addition to like a cocktail. Um, and actually my wife, she does a lot of brewing, um, beer brewing, and she would make every year, she would make a pine needle beer. So um, you get that. You have to be a little bit careful with the flavor because pine is quite strong. And also it is, um, can be a bit sort of, you know, like, toilet cleaner <laughs> flavor as well. So it's by getting that kind of balance right. But if you get it right, it's delicious, like um, a really amazing sort of kind of resinous, you know, sort of rosemary like in your nose flavor. So yeah, great. Fantastic, that's brilliant. Um, another question, um, what, what, what time of year does wild garlic appear normally? So um, wild garlic, I have picked, funny, I was looking at photographs um, of of this year um, from the start of the very year, the very start of the year, I should say. And I actually picked the first wild garlic for me in January. Um, and, and that is quite early. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I live in the city. So uh, things in the city always feel a little bit further ahead. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you pick wild garlic in January everywhere. But certainly for me, that was the first time I'd pick wild garlic was the end of January. Um, so yeah, you're talking from early spring but definitely I mean you could check you could definitely check your spots if you have a, a dedicated wild garlic spot which a lot of people do check from February onwards um, and if you're lucky you'll pick it right until June so what's interesting about um, 
lots of kind of early of those ephemeral grains that we only get those little tiny windows for is that they're really affected by altitude. So um, I have spots where, like say in the city that are very close to me that are less than 10 minutes walk from me. In fact, my house where I pick wild garlic and I'll pick that from January, but I'll go to places that are a little higher up and a little further away and a little more northerly. And I'll be able to pick, you know, right until maybe the middle of June, if I'm, if I'm lucky. It really depends on the year. But even if you go for summer in between there, you know, you're talking March time, you're guaranteed to find your wild garlic. Fantastic. Um, and is it, there's it, there's more than one type of wild garlic, isn't there, Claire? Or I mean, the other one is is it three cornered leek? Yeah. So a lot of yeah, a lot of people are. That's the two. That's the two types that people are mostly aware of. There's actually a few other kind of wild um, allium species as well, but those would be the two that are most common here. And a lot of people kind of call both. Um, uh, three cornered leek and wild garlic wild garlic and, and technically they are both a wild garlic they're both a wild allium but um they're quite they're quite distinct in their appearance and actually i think they're quite distinct in their flavor as well um so three cornered leek is um a uh, beautiful plant has three corners in its stem which is in, in its leaf stem and in its flower stem which is why it gets the same three cornered leek and um, I was just trying to think of the scientific name of there and I was going to show off, but I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> but Ali, um, uh, wild garlic is Allium ursinum, which is what I remember because ursinum is as in like Ursa Major, which is um, the great bear. And it's sometimes called bear garlic. So that, that name stays in my mind. But um, so yeah, three cornered leek has the three corners and has a flower almost like um, a kind of, um, I guess like a, a white bluebell is what I would describe it as. And there was three corners in the stem. So those are your kind of um, how you identify it, um, but also the smell. So to me, um, three cornered lake is much more like a scallion. So like a fresh onion flavor, whereas white garlic has more of a pungent aromatic um, flavor um, in its leaves. But both are really delicious and both are really quite usable in, you know, exchangeable in recipes as well. So you can certainly make pesto such a classic one with wild garlic. You can certainly make a three cornered lake pesto, but the flavor will be quite different. OK, that, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Claire. And um, another question for Aaron, probably. Um, your recipe, how, what would you, how would you substitute that um, to make it suitable for a vegan? So oh, you could use oil instead of butter, I take it? Um, yeah, phyllo, uh, shop-bought phyllo is almost always, I mean, I don't even think, I even, you know, phyllo is not made with butter, it's made with oil, so um, it's almost always vegan. Um, so uh, you can check the back of the pack, but um, I would use phyllo lots for vegan clients. So yeah, so just, um, uh, you would just... Um, uh, use oil, um, either olive oil or sunflower oil. Um, actually, I use rapeseed oil quite often when I'm doing this because it does crisp it up quite nicely. So you could get like a local rapeseed oil and use that. Um, and then if you wanted to kind of bulk out the greens a bit, so just have a kind of a bit of a kind of additional um, sort of um, and kind of umami flavor in there, I would probably get some nice little mushrooms. So to this time of year, it'd be good. You can get some lovely little wild mushrooms, cook them down separately. Um, uh, not in the pan with the greens because you want to kind of try and get the moisture out of them as much as possible. So a nice hot pan, wee tiny bit of oil, cook them nice and hot, um, chopped up, and then mix them through the um, the greens and um, then just proceed and you'd, it would be delicious. Sure. And could, and could you um, could you swap out the feta for tofu? Would that work? Or Yeah, I was actually thinking that. Um, it'd be quite nice. And actually, I think if I was doing that, I'd I might change the flavor profile a bit and go with slightly kind of more Asian flavors. It would work really nicely. So you could put, instead of putting the kind of lemon and those type of things in it, I'd maybe put a wee dash of soy in it. And um, and then, you know, your sesame seeds on top um, would be lovely. So that would kind of give a lovely sort of Asian flavor. And actually, um, I there's a really nice recipe um, on my website, which is like super easy. Um, we talked about doing it actually for this, but we thought maybe it's even too simple for you know, it's nice to do something slightly more advanced for this, but I do it, uh, we make it a lot. I would actually probably eat it. It's almost the thing I eat the most in my house. It's like stir fried greens with garlic and soy. And it's a great recipe for all these type of greens that you would pick. You could put nettles, sea beet, um, uh, all the sour thistle, sorrel, any of those greens could go in there. 
Um, and if you're only got a handful of wild greens and you want to supplement it with a kind of some kale that you're growing in the garden or some spinach you're growing in the garden or something, just get a whole mass of greens and then you just basically fry it with a little tiny bit of garlic, sunflower oil or peanut oil, garlic, um, and uh, then all your greens in until they wilt down, almost the same process that we do in this recipe. And then at the end, just season it with um, some soy sauce and a little bit of sesame oil. And if you want a spicy, you can put some chili in at the beginning or you can just leave it out and then some toasted sesame seeds on top. And like, it's a great way of getting loads of extra greens into, you know, if you've got a curry or something like that and you're thinking actually there's only like chicken in this curry, there's no vegetables, chicken and rice. So you could just do that really quickly and have it alongside. And actually I do it and just have it on toast quite often, you know, if you just feel like I need a few more greens in my diet, it's a really good way of doing it. Wow, you're making me hungry and I've already had my supper. So. <laughs> already. Um, another question has, has come in there. Are there any plants that are protected that you shouldn't pick? Ooh. Yes, there are. So we have, um, in Northern Ireland, we have our own list of protected plants. Um, and you'll find that if you look up um, Cedar, or an amazing organisation, that work with um, NMNI, uh, National Museums Northern Ireland, and they uh, document our plants. And then there's a few other, um, like British Society for um, Botanical, oh, I can't remember what their proper name is, but they have information about that as well. But if you, if you even if you do a quick um, search for information about uh, plants, the legal status of plants in Northern Ireland, you'll get a good bit of information there that just comes from, from our government um, side. So in the in that information there is um, there is stuff about the legal uh, requirements of of uh, collecting plants or picking plants or the legal status of picking flowers and things like that. If people are interested in reading that, there's lots of kind of heavy detail. But there's one big section um, which is uh, quite important um, to, and pertains to that, which is called Section Eight, which is um, uh, the list of protected plants and animals actually as well. So there's quite a big list of protected um, plants and animals on that and the reason why they're protected is obviously because they're endangered or they're at risk and therefore they're incredibly rare so if you're concerned at all about um, coming across those and not realizing that as a forager I wonder if, I guess that's the question that you're asking here in my experience, um, uh, if you're sticking to the things that are incredibly common, so the things we've already talked about today, so um, wild garlic, nettles, um, uh, tree leaves and things like that, if you stick to those things when you're starting out as a forager, you begin to add those things to your repertoire and then you begin to recognize other things. So in my experience, even though I'm not a botanist, um, it's coming across those plants that I don't recognize. Um, uh, and I have not studied, I know I'm aware of the list and I know things that are on the list. So examples are like sea kale and um, oyster leaf and cow slip and things like that. Those are on the list. And it's more being aware of them being standing out as unusual plants when I'm foraging myself that have made the kind of me kind of um, kind of go, oh, what is that? I don't recognize that. I wonder, is that a rare plant? Um, and that sounds really, really vague, but actually it just shows you it's really important to start off with the basics when you're foraging um, so you don't come across those plants because um, those plants are protected um, to the point that you can't even collect a seed from them because they're so rare um, and they're so protected. So sea kale is a really good example because it is actually prolific in the rest of Ireland and in the UK. Um, and it's not protected there, but it is protected in Northern Ireland. And um, and I have come across it actually, and I um, I knew immediately that it wasn't a plant that I was familiar with, and it made me kind of stop and go, oh, I wonder what that is, and kind of do a bit of research first. So yeah, we do. We have lots and lots of protected plants. We have lots of plants that have died out, unfortunately, as well. So yeah, um, sustainability and being aware of those um, things when you're a forager. Um, are really, really important. But like I say, if you're sticking to the really common, the abundant things, um, it's not something that you need to have on your agenda at all. That's great. Thanks very much, Claire. That's lovely. Um, uh, next question. Uh, are there any many green plants that are poisonous? 
Yes. <laughs> so, so, um, so we're not going to cover any uh, information on fungi in these webinars, um, which is good because it's not something you cover in a webinar. But in plants, yes. So um, I always say um, for a forager, it's it's not um, it's it's quite easy to avoid the poisonous plants if you stick to plant families. So. The plant family that contains the most dangerous plants um, in our country are the Apiaceae family, which is the carrot or pa parsley family. Um, so in that family, we have um, our really deadly plants, which are hemlock, poison hemlock, which might ring a bell with some people, and hemlock water drop wort. So those are two very, very common, actually very, very common poisonous plants. Um, they resemble cow parsley, so like say they're in the parsley family. So lots of parsley family plants have those kind of carrot top style leaves. And, um, but they do have distinctive attributes as well. So cow parsley um, is edible and you can collect it and you can use it. It has a flavor um, like chervil or parsley. Um, but you do have to be aware of the poisonous um, uh, poisonous members of that family too before you can start including it in your foraging and and honestly it was quite a few years before I was really confident um, collecting cow parsley and being confident about this differentiating it between um, hemlock and hemlock water drop work because those plants are incredibly dangerous and, and are completely deadly so um, it's important to um, to be aware of them but um, what, what I would say to you if you want to avoid those ones is just avoid that family um, to get started. So, cause that's what I did. I never collected those until I was really, really confident in my identification skills. Um, the best way to do that is actually go out with somebody and see, and those, those really poisonous, those two members of that family um, appear in the summertime. Um, so um, that's the best time to kind of go out and it, kind of study those, but it just takes practice. But like I say, avoid them in the first place and then kind of get to know their, know their kind of the um, little specifications of their appearance. Um, there's also um, uh, tanned hogweed is also in that family as well. Um, and it's a lot of people will be already aware of how dangerous it is. It has a, a toxin in it that gives you really bad burns on your skin. So yeah, those are the dangerous plants to avoid. And the, the kind of greater um, family of plants, it's actually, if you avoid those ones, um, you're doing pretty well to, to kind of start to include other things in your in your repertoire. So observation is really, really important. Once you start to add those kind of different ty types of plants in, you, you begin to realize, you know, how um, you begin to notice the kind of different um, shapes of leaves and things like that. But if, it, it, like I say, avoid that parsley, that um, poisonous family to start off with if you're getting going and, and stick to your kind of distinctive plants. That's great. Very good advice. Um, so thank you for that. Claire, um, another one for Erin. Um, what would you do with meadow sweet? Oh, well, Claire, we can answer this as well. But um, mm -hmm. we've, well, we were talking about beer earlier. So we've used it a few times in beer. Actually, we just did a, another meadow sweet beer, slow and meadow sweet. So um, uh, if you are a brewer or you know someone who's a brewer, um, lots of these plants can be added in um, towards the end of the boil in the same way that you would add in hops. So if you get some of these kind of um, sort of fragrant flowers and things like that, like elderflowers or meadowsweet, um, and also lots of the kind of plants that we've talked about, um, berries and things like that, um, we would use lots of them to make kind of uh, wild beers. So that's definitely um, a good use. Um, I've used it to make a syrup before um, and then, uh, you can make you can make that into a sorbet as well. But I know that Claire's made an amazing sugar with it, dried the seeds, uh, dried the flowers out, and then made a really beautiful sugar with it, which she bakes with. So that's a really delicious thing. But maybe Claire can say a bit more about how she did that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so yeah, th there's still meta sweet out there actually, um, and it's delicious, and uh, it's one of my favorite flavors, and I've used loads of it this year. Um, it's worth knowing that. Um, the, that, that kind of almondy um, uh, flavor that comes from um, meadow sweet is, uh, is something that can be affected by airborne molds. 
and it actually can make it into, into something that's kind of uh, a bit nasty for you. It might make you a wee bit sick. So it's really important if you're going to use it in the way that I'm about to describe that you pick it and then you dry it really, really quickly so it doesn't get an opportunity to get moldy. Um, and so, yeah, and that's really easy to do. Just pick it and dry it on the day that you get it. So you can do that by either, I like to hang things above a radiator, works quite nicely, or if you don't, if you um, have a dehydrator or even better, like um, a low oven as well will work quite nicely. So yeah, and then I, this year I've done lots of meadow sweet sugar items. So basically taking those beautiful kind of creamy flowers, drying them really quickly and really thoroughly, and then mixing them with um, granulated sugar or caster sugar and using those um, either as an ingredient itself to mix through like a cake mix or a biscuit mix or finishing things with it. So um, uh, this season I've done loads of, tons of shortbread, actually Erin's uh, amazing um, German biscuit shortbread recipe, which is like one of my favorites um, and is incredibly popular among um, the groups that I've brought it out to. I've probably made a thousand of those biscuits this year with a little bit of meadow sweet sugar sprinkled on top of it. Um, and it's incredible. It, it, it truly has like a, an almond essence, almond extract flavor when used in that way. So that's definitely by far my favorite way to use it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and another one, sweet woodruff. Can you, can you make anything with sweet woodruff? Yeah, so so in the same way, actually, very. I mean, I would use that. That um, I feel like fundamentally they have quite a similar flavour, meadow sweet and 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 sweet bread rough. Um, so I would use them in the same way. So sweet bread rough, sweet no, sweet bread rough is lovely. Um, again, a lovely almondy uh, kind of heady flavour and um, works beautifully in any kind of dessert application. So this year. Actually, in the early spring, I made um, like a frangipan style um, mix using sweet bread rough, um, mixing it through um, with some hazelnuts to make um, like a bakewell tart, which worked really, really well because it has that kind of like heady, almondy, floral flavor. Um, so that's the way I would go with it. Um, I, I've used it mostly to make kind of syrups and added to just sweet things, but it's also lovely. Um, a really, really nice thing to do if anybody's a drinker to make your own gin. So um, Sweet Bread Rough is one of the kind of main flavor profiles in um, Zubroska vodka, the Polish vodka. And um, you can make your own kind of like uh, flavorings, like your own kind of bespoke botanicals um, for alcohol. So either vodka or gin, but gin especially, and introduce um, a bit of that into that. And it works so, so nicely. Um, so again, just use, uh, treat it the same way. So gather it, dry it, um, and um, pop it into, or even use it fresh actually, and pop it into some gin um, would be definitely top of my list if I had. I don't, I don't find it that often. So if anybody has a big patch of it, I'm quite jealous. Um, <laughs> that's how I would use it. I, I actually um, planted quite a bit of it this year for oh, lovely around the place, but for the bees actually mostly because they love it and yeah. they. And they do say, um, Robert, who's like my beekeeper mentor, told me that um, they did studies on it and, and that sweet woodruff is, is, it's kind of got similar properties to Maruka for, for the bees. So, oh, wow. so it's good to know I can do something else with them as well. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so, oh yeah, Jeanette has sent a question in. Um, to say when looking for elderberries are they easily identifiable i've been told to make sure i get the correct tree so who would like to take that well, I think identification is definitely claire's strong point <laughs> rather than that i think they're quite easily identifiable but i don't know if like is there anything else that's out at this time of year that would be so it's funny that I wonder, so I didn't actually witness this myself, but I saw something about a thread on Twitter about um, a TV program using uh, berries that were not elderberries, but saying that they were on a TV show in the last week or so. Um, but I don't know, I don't, I don't know where it was, but I thought it was pretty funny um, uh, and kind of really, really, um, really bad. But anyway, one, I think somebody said that they might be, ha might have been using um, dogwood 
berries. So dogwood are, are a plant that produces um, a berry. And there's also like a uh, common buckthorn as well produces a blackberry. Um, but honestly, there's, um, I feel like elderberries are pretty, pretty simple, like Aaron said, pretty straightforward to identify. So um, uh, I would be so helped by some illustrations here. But um, so elder are really a tree, you know, they're kind of like an overgrown shrub, mostly. Um, they have um, leaflets that are in the shape of five with one at the top sometimes in seven with one of the top opposite leaves. And um, the berries, especially at this time of year, they're really quite easy to spot. I mean, in fact, I can spot them from nearly, you know, half a mile away. Um, they'll be heavy and dark and they'll almost like appear like a, a bunch of grapes, like drooping down from the, the, the branch that they're on. Um, if you give them a squeeze, they should, when they're ready to go, especially, they should feel like juicy and they should produce like a purpley red juice um, um, from them. Um, and, um, and you'll even know they'll smell sweet and things like that. Um, dogwood berries, um, the plant is definitely like a bush, like a hedge. The leaves are quite different. Um, the berries are not juicy like that and they won't smell like, uh, you know, they won't smell like fruity and delicious like elderberries will. Um, best way honestly it's hard for me to describe but the best way is actually to just even just do we a quick google search will bring up lots of images of elder leaves and things like that so learning your leaves and learning your bark are really helpful for picking things out but especially um immediately now there'll be lots and lots of those heavy bunches of berries that are nice and black and dark hanging on the trees sure i think too if, if you know obviously if if you're lucky enough to have an elder flower tree close to you you'll be able to see the flowers first yes. and, and, you know, the look of them and the smell of them kind of helps you then to identify what the berries would be. So have we any more questions from anybody at all? Um, Kieran in the chat room has said he took part in a cookery class with Bran McDermott and he used a lot of wild garlic and wild leeks. I know Bran McDermott is, he's the foil hotel, I think, in... Donegal, so um, so that probably makes sense. He's mm -hmm. a great guy, complete agent sometimes, but <laughs> we're better all together. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody? No other questions? Oh. The only, uh, well, I don't know whether this is helpful, but I was just thinking about when we were talking about uh, we were talking lots about um, CV, um, and I was just thinking that when I was I was cooking this afternoon making a uh, actually a phyllo pie type thing and I was picking some stuff in the garden and I was thinking because obviously lots of people are growing as part of this project and um, not just foraging um one of the things that we grow in our garden which is like so useful so if you're not actually thinking you're going to go out and do foraging um or you're not close to the sea seashore or whatever a great thing to grow is perpetual spinach which is basically almost the same as sea beet um and if you're we grow spinach as well, but spinach is quite, it's not the easiest thing to grow in the world. It feels like it should be, but it's not the easiest thing to grow because it goes to seed so quickly, especially in Northern Ireland with the long days in the summer. It just, you know, you get a kind of window early on in the season when you can grow it and then maybe later on in the season, but that kind of middle chunk, it's really tricky. So we grow a lot of perpetual spinach and use that as a replacement for regular spinach. And it's basically the same plant. It's, um, as Claire was saying in the video, um, like beetroots and Swiss chard or rainbow chard, um, uh, perpetual spinach and sea beet are basically um, all uh, related and, and very similar and you can eat um, the leaves and stalks of all of them. So um, it's definitely worth seeking out if you've had any issues growing spinach or also if you just want a green that'll go, go and go without really having to do any work. Our, our sea beet would, you know, we would, it would go in this time of year and we'd still be harvesting it you know, um, well, it's gone in a wee bit earlier than this, but, you know, goes in in the, you know, early autumn, late, late spring or late summer. And, you know, it'll keep going all the way through the winter. Now it won't grow loads, but, you know, if you're only harvesting for a family or something like that, you can definitely get it going right through until the, um, uh, you know, kind of May, June time. And then, it, you know, then it'll probably go to seed. So it's a great, it's a great plant to think about growing, you know, if you want, if you're looking for something to put in the garden as well as for foraging. I think it's important to just to um, just point out that um, like the greens, the greens are so important nutritionally.
for us, aren't they? You know, whether you're growing them or foraging them, all the good stuff's in there, really. I know Joe was saying, my, my wife was saying today, she just heard an article on, um, on the radio or, or read it in the paper, but they were saying that 50% of vegetable intake in the UK comes from just four plants, which are carrots, tomatoes, peas and onions. So, um, so yeah, so like diversity of diet is really important. Apparently that's actually not too bad. You know, you are getting quite a lot of the different things there, but you know, they, they asked a nutritionist or a, a dietitian um, and they were saying, you know, what, it, you know, you'd be pretty good there as long as you added in a leafy green, you know, you'd be ticking a lot of boxes. So I think it is those leafy greens that are, you know, are so important. And, you know, one of the things I was just thinking about this webinar before, you know, getting the wild greens or the greens you're growing in the garden, you know, just stirring them, through, you know, you're making a bean stew or you're making, a, you know, a chunky minestrone soup or you're making a curry, you know, just a handful of those greens stirred through at the end like you know even if you're not a massive greens fan you won't really notice them and they're like just so much you know additional goodness into that meal you know it's really worth doing yeah 100 percent, and, and even like pasta and rice dishes and stuff especially things like you know like the the leek, like the spinach type leaves or the, you know they just kind of melt in don't they yeah. so. and actually there's a great if you like those type of flavors that we did in the video there's a really great um greek dish as well called spana carizzo which is very similar but made with rice so those similar flavors spinach and onions and lemon and feta but stirred through you know kind of cooked through almost like a kind of greek style risotto um so if you're into those type of flavors it's definitely worth googling a recipe for spana carizzo because it's really delicious and a great way to use those wild greens again well, listen, that's fantastic. We're um, our, well, we're over time again, but that's okay because the crack was great and, and the chat was, and there's so much information again. So um, thank you very much to Claire and Erin. Um, and we have, we've one left, can't believe we've two finished already. So we've one left, which won't be next week. It'll be the, the week after on the 27th. Um, and uh, in the meantime, if whatever you're making or har foraging or harvesting, keep sending me photographs of them because we'd love to see them. So uh, thanks a million. Yes, thank you.